only thing that stands between Gene and death has been his cardiac defibrillator. I sometimes worry about having my affairs in order. We need a new heart for Gene very soon. The baby came out with severe respiratory distress. Her lungs were collapsing. It's very sad to go home without your baby. The things that I loved are being taken away. The person who he was, he is no longer. The doctor said, you know, you get the hip of a 65, 70-year-old man. These are stories of real people. I have a stroke code. Mrs. Bentley. Oh, your husband is right in the middle of a stroke. Mr. Bentley, can you open your eyes again? Lives touched by nurses, doctors, staff, and volunteers, all on a journey dedicated to making health care better. Hi, it's Colleen. Can I help you? So much of what we do every day is about offering people second chances. Okay, I'm on my way. Thanks. Bye. Second chances to do things they never thought they'd do again. We're literally giving them a second chance at life. These are stories of the sharp experience. I kind of like to have my husband back. We just got married. Hi, Cheryl. I'm just calling to see how Jean's doing. Call me when you get home from home. We went to the Del Coronado after the reception. Poor Jean sat up all night to try and get his breath. He just got worse and he passed out on me. He scared me to death, so I called 911. I'm very concerned about Jean. We, we need a new heart for Jean very soon. rough weekend and he was just out of it one whole day he was just in a fetal position just you know you couldn't rouse him and I just went down to the chapel. Gene has spent the last months in terminal heart failure unable to do the simplest things of everyday life the only thing that stands between Gene and death has been his cardiac defibrillator Heart transplant poses not just physical challenges, but mental challenges. Someone is on eggshells. They know they have a life-threatening condition. They know that there is something that can be done about it, but they don't know when. Waiting for donors is still our, our challenge. Um, we've been averaging about one transplant a month, a total of 284 to date. As a matter of fact, San Diego's first heart transplant was done right here at Sharp Memorial Hospital in 1985. Vicki and I are the two coordinators. We um, alternate call. I can't think of anything more rewarding than to have the ability to give people a second chance at life. We have six patients currently waiting for a heart. He's at the top of the list. And we would like nothing better than find Gene, a new heart, and get him on his honeymoon. I have my cell phone and even Gene's cell phone. They go with me everywhere. I pray every night that I'll get a call. I've been a nursing supervisor for many, many years. And I really have a good understanding of healthcare the way it was meant to be delivered. What's really exciting is watching the lead that we're taking to make healthcare better. We started on this journey called the Sharp Experience five years ago, and it's a completely different world. The basis of everything we do here is really to treat people the way that we would want our families treated, and we'd want to be treated ourselves. It's really nothing more than the golden rule. He can't run when we play tennis. It gets me really sad. Oh, I am definitely broken. It's like living with an older man. My dad's more active than Matt is and in a lot less pain. Than Sometimes I feel like, oh, this hurts, and I realize, hey, I shouldn't be complaining because my dad has to go through this constantly. No healthy functioning hip. There's a certain degree of cartilage, which is lubricant, which allows your bones to rotate without hitting each other. And my cartilage has, has worn away completely on the inside. So the bones actually start grinding against each other, and it hurts. Let's go, Jacob. The man I married was biking, swimming, doing triathlons, doing marathons. We were out active all the time. And we can't do any of that. Most athletes don't look for sympathy. His self-esteem and a lot of his ego was built upon the activities that he did with a passion for such a long period of time. And when you lose that, you lose a part of yourself. One of the worst is when I'm teaching all fall in front of a group of high school kids, which is humiliating. It makes you feel old and incompetent. He had to give up surfing a while ago, and that's been really, really hard for him. 
this winter. I'd surfed one day and I could not move afterwards. I went to the doctor and he said, you know, you've got the hip of a 65, 70 year old man. The things that I loved are being taken away. Matt developed arthritis in his hip, and right now the best option would be a hip replacement Bye surgery. Oh, good, good. Okay. We've been waiting for you guys. How are you? Nice okay. to see you. My name's Mary Margaret. I'm one of the nurses here. Okay. I'm help My you first today. reaction was, I'm never going to have, you know, hip replacement surgery. Uh -huh. I mean, that's a very, I think, normal reaction when you're in your 40s. But the pain that I have is the advanced form, so I just decided to do it. In Matt's case, he didn't have any large trauma to us. He never dislocated it. He doesn't have any problems with vascular disease. It's just a genetic predisposition. Everything's set up downstairs. And he is exactly who you want as a doctor. He looks at my x-rays and he goes, you're in a lot of pain. You need a hip replacement. He's very confident. And I went, wow, I'm in the right hands. He really needs to have this done. We had to drive pain pills to school for him yesterday because he was in so much pain. Oh, I'm just kind of overwhelmed. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? That's normal. That's normal. We're going to take very good care of him. I love you. It's fine. This is a good thing. So. Don't worry. <laughs> just take a nice nap. What we want to do is put an artificial hip in in exactly the same position as the natural hip using a minimally invasive two incision technique. Through the front of the joint we split the muscle and put the socket in and through a small incision in the back and we're able to put the stem in. The advantage of this approach is that you have a very stable hip and the risk of dislocation is very very small. Using the navigation system we're able to tell where our implants are going within a degree. Just making sure the stem's straight. It looks perfect. When I'm putting the socket component in, I'll actually see on the screen the computer-generated image of that socket. Right now we're going to find the center rotation of the hip. It's telling us that we just brought him down a millimeter or two, so we basically reproduce his anatomy. Everything looks good. utterly without pain for the first time in five or six years. <laughs> well, if it was miraculous, that would mean I'm the only one, but I think that this is how it works. I feel better surfing. First time I paddled out, I just paddled in the ocean. And then the next weekend, did, did better. And then last weekend, I, it was, the surf was big, and I could surf, and surf pain-free. I'm back. I'm definitely back. Every time I walk up the hill from Blacks, that's when I realize how healthy I am. I'm walking up the hill, there's no pain. Stories of the Sharp Experience is brought to you by Sharp Healthcare, with hospitals and medical offices countywide. Sharp accepts almost all health insurance. Call 1-800-82-SHARP or visit sharp.com. telling me you have a heart for me <laughs> and I said I wish I was telling you that but I wasn't and so now I am this is, it. this is it well the plan right now is I'm still waiting for my final cross matches I just called they said probably 30 more minutes Dr. Adamson said he will be here about 10 30 we're doing the most sensitive cross matches and those do take five hours we wait for these faxes to come through telling us it's the last hurdle that we've passed Gene told me that his defibrillator had gone off three times and never had done that before. He was afraid, he was scared, and told me that he just wanted me to know he loved me. <laughs> and so I came racing over here. The first thing that you notice is how big this heart is. It is two to three times as large as a normal heart should be. Next, you see this uh, automatic internal defibrillator. This is the unit that has delivered those three shocks today. Gene? Cross matches are perfect. Oh, everything. I'm going to let everyone know we're definite. Congratulations. <laughs> the coordinator is here and she said everything looks like it's So um, we're still on for midnight. 
donor still stable. Well, you've had a rough day today. Yeah. Oh, he's incredibly sick right now. Just the induction of anesthesia is life-threatening. The surgical team will be myself, Dr. Dimbitsky, and Dr. Baradarian. We've worked with Dr. Dimbitsky for 20 years and Dr. Baradarian for a long time, and, and we'll take good care of him. We have to make the final decision about whether a particular heart is implanted or not. We want our surgeon to go and look at the heart while it's beating and call us and say, we have a great heart here, yes, we're going to go ahead. People feel strange waiting for somebody to die. By the time we know about the donor, everything medically has been done to keep them alive. And it's the graciousness of that family to donate their organs that then allows us to have the opportunity to help our patient. We'd like to have the new heart sewn in within four hours. It can lose its ability to beat strongly, and then it will not be strong enough to sustain Gene's life. Hey, Colonel. Semper Fi, baby. My name is Pam, and I'm the charge nurse here tonight. Okay. We're going to get you all settled, okay? Good. All right. I sometimes worry about having my affairs in order if things don't go right. Take good care of him. Very good. Are you warm enough? Oh, yeah. I love you. Uh, Dr. Baradarian is at the donor hospital assessing the strength of the new heart. The donor has been in a traumatic accident that has left them brain dead, and so they're being sustained on life support. He has to look at the donor's body, visualize the state of their health, and when he has the chest open, can see if the heart is a strong, healthy heart. Hey, well, the heart's good. So uh, head on in. All right, bye. Got the news that the new heart is strong. It'll be another hour before the new heart arrives. He'll be put off to sleep and, and we'll be started. It's gonna happen. <laughs> Gene has had operations in the past that have caused his heart tissue to adhere to the back of his sternum. Is he being paced now, Mark? There is a possibility that in re-entering his chest that a portion of his heart may be injured which could culminate in life terminating bleeding. The order's right there. Hold your lungs. Mark, give the heparin. And another pack like this, 11 blade. Okay, start transfusing and keep, keep up. Give us a, some coronary suckers. Very quickly, Mark. Yeah, we're giving volume. People come to healthcare because they have some form of need. Oftentimes it's something totally unexpected. And we deal with all the different emotions, the apprehension, the unknowns, everything we do, every kindness is on behalf of that patient and their family. I'm nervous. Every time I see him, I feel like I'm gonna cry. I have to leave him here. That's hard. I cannot do that. I don't want to leave him. My name is Francis, and I'll be the one taking care of your baby today. It's very hard on the families if we say the baby can't go home when mom goes home. To leave a baby here is devastating. Babies' livers aren't as strong and mature as ours. When they're in mom, the mom's liver works for them. When they're born, all of a sudden their liver has to take over, and sometimes it's just not strong enough. How long you guys will keep him here? It all depends. We will check again the bilirubin level, you know. Bilirubin means the baby's yellow or jaundice. The worry is, if not treated, this bilirubin can get into the brain and cause brain damage. What we're doing is phototherapy. We expose as much body part as possible. The special light helps break down the bilirubin. I don't want to go. I want to stay here with him. Even though they're going to feed him, they're going to change him. Still, I have to stay here. Let me just get you a chair so you can sit by your baby. As soon as the babies are stable, we get the parents involved right away. Let them make some decisions. We try to keep making them feel that, hey, this is your baby. We're just taking care of it for the moment. They didn't bring the baby to me right away. She was in an incubator with everything, machines, and I couldn't hold her. It's very sad to go home without your baby. Bedside care is very difficult in the first two or three hours with an infant like that. Her lungs were collapsing. 
and we were up at 100% oxygen. And she wasn't holding her saturation. Meconium blocks the breathing tubes in the lung that lets air in but not out. With each breath, the lung gets bigger and bigger like a balloon and finally overexpands and pops. They placed tubes in her, trying to get her to breathe. I thought I was just going to take her home. I never expected her to be sick when she was born. Okay. Eat first and then sleep. We have visitation 24 hours at all the sharp NICUs, so the parents can come anytime. It's never going to be home, but we try to make it as close to home as we can. The doctor came in this morning and decided the baby can go home. I want him to just go to school, just keep on going to school, don't stop. That's what, <laughs> that's what I want him to do. <laughs> well, the nurses established this wonderful bond with the family. And they come so close to them that many of the nurses are invited to the baby's christening or brisses. You see them from the first day of life and then, you know, as they improve and really get well and then ready to go home. We really miss them. Every time I come in here, someone's holding her, someone's feeding her. She's being loved. We were feeding her through a tube. It goes from the nose to the stomach. That tube is now out and she's feeding all on her own. Within the next day or so, I'm hoping that she'll get to go home with mommy. I didn't think the day was going to come that I would get to take her home or hold her, even hold her. I hope to raise a nice young lady <laughs> with a good heart. And you smile because you're happy they're going home, but then again you're going to miss them. But then you know you're going to get somebody else, someone else's parents will be happy. You are so beautiful <laughs> to me. Uh, we're just reintroduce that buzz. Ty, please. Mark, how long is the pressure down? Give me that Venus tube. ML suction canister at this moment. Look how big that heart is. He wouldn't have made it another day, I would say. Give him an empty bucket with filled with cold saline. Pretty good size. The most stressful part of the surgical implantation is, is the heart going to work? Bag the lungs. We take the air out of the heart and we remove a clamp that's on the aorta. That allows the blood from the heart-lung machine to fill the arteries of the heart and then it starts beating on its own. Heart's beating. Pace at 60. Looks good to me. Well, tell the family what happened. A third of the attention and care that I give to a patient is rendered to their family. Because while my patient is under general anesthesia, the family is the one suffering. The new heart went in very quickly and it's beating right now very well. I'm delighted that we took the heart and I'm delighted that the heart was strong. Uh, because I just don't know how many more days he could have gone with the heart that was as weak. We had some real troubles. The graft that he had before, the vein graft, it was stuck right into the sternum as I was concerned about. When we sawed through the bone, the graft was right there and started bleeding very rapidly, obviously. So we put him on the heart-lung machine. That takes a few minutes. 
even though it was all exposed and we were prepared. Um, during that few minutes he was bleeding quite a bit from here and his blood pressure got very low. It could be that there's no consequence whatsoever and he wakes up normal, or it could be that he's, he'll have irreparable brain damage. That's possible. The next major hurdle is will he wake up? I, I reiterate that I believe he will, but it's unpredictable right now. Uh, I think this heart's going to work fine, but he was very sick. Okay. Come here, dear. <clears throat> Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. God bless you. It's hard for you to get those sad news. <laughs> Stories of the Sharp Experience is brought to you by Sharp Healthcare, with hospitals and medical offices countywide. Sharp accepts almost all health insurance. Call 1 800 82 Sharp or visit sharp.com. Call to the home of the 76 year old male patient. Per the wife here, all of a sudden his speech became very slurred, and then he just crumpled to the ground. Hi, how are you? He doesn't have a facial drip. Yeah, he has a facial drip. It's hard to tell because we have him laying on his back. He's trying to get him to smile, but he just opens his mouth real wide. Hi, it's Sue in the ER. I have a stroke code. Your run number is 2404813. 76 years old, his first speech, to the ground. Here we get a name. Carol, definitely. Carol, definitely. Yeah. We got there, he's sitting against the wall. He's able to squeeze his thumbs, and that was pretty much it. Very the quicker that strokes can be treated, the better outcome we can expect. Mm -hmm. Stroke is a sudden injury to the brain caused either by a blood clot clogging a blood vessel or a burst blood vessel causing a hemorrhage or bleeding in the brain. Smile for us. Can you smile real big? There's only one drug that is FDA approved to treat stroke, and that's TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator, and that dissolves clots. Nice deep breath, sir. Sir. Let's go to CT. It's the strongest medication we have when used early. However, we can't use it beyond three hours of onset of symptoms. A CT scan is primarily done to rule out a hemorrhage because you don't want to treat a hemorrhage with, with clot-busting agents. They wanted to do TPA. There's just no waiting around at all. Hi, I'm Dr. Brandy. Can you open your eyes, Mr. Bentley? Can you hear me? Okay, and what you're going to do? Mr. Bentley? Huh. Can you see this picture? Uh, I don't go into anything. Uh, well, how about this? He is aphasic. He has trouble getting the right words out. Some of them are gibberish, nonsense words. So he's in danger of losing his ability to speak. That would mean he would completely lose his independence. I'd like to check your strength. Hold that arm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you hold that one up? Hold it up there. Hold it. One, two, three. It's a little bit of a drift on one side, so he may have a mild weakness. I cannot give TPA without a history. Here's our TPA. So the family member's input was crucial. We're, we're good to go. 954. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Just try and relax a little bit, Harold. It's in. The first week after the stroke, you're still at higher risk to have another stroke. So it's a very unstable situation. This morning he was very disoriented, very dizzy, stumbling around, and that's just not like him. The first thing that went through my mind was stroke. I knew time is of the essence, and thank God he got brought here. And my message would be that call 911. Even though the, the thought seems to be, I can get you in the car and get you there quicker. Something could happen in that car, suddenly the person next to you collapses. How are you going to manage that? Anybody could treat a stroke, but we are the certified stroke center, so those medics know they need to start heading towards Sharp Grossmont. I've got resources at that bedside, and they are waiting for that stroke code to come in. Stroke symptoms 911. Time. The clock is ticking. 
He called my mother this morning and freaked her out a little bit because, you know, the phone rings at 5.45 in the morning. It was him. Where's my glasses? Where's my car? <laughs> every, every time they come by, they ask the same question. How are you feeling? They better yes. And uh, pay, pay, put your hands out like this for 10 seconds. Yeah, okay. Do that for 10 seconds on your ankles or something. And, Rub your stomach and pat your head. <laughs> oh yeah, just one right after another. Well, it's amazing. Even 24 hours. Remarkable difference. He is so coherent now. It's just yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> we were chatting with the nurses last night just about his condition out here and he says from the other room, be quiet out there. Like, okay, dad's back. <laughs> He's doing remarkably well. I think he's going to bounce back. He's definitely motivated. He's got grandkids to live for. <laughs> um, where does the catcher sit for dinner? I don't know. Behind the plate. Oh, behind the plate, okay. <laughs> Delivering excellent clinical care, and yet never forgetting that human side is really what this is all about. We always think of it like if it was your mom or your grandma in the bed, and how you would want them to be taken care of. Sometimes all it takes is holding their hand to make that human connection. I found a little book of senior memories. We were about 17, and it had all the dances, and it's Christmas formal, Jean Taylor and Valentine's formal Jean Taylor. Stumpin'. <laughs> I'm profoundly grateful that I've, that I've been given a second chance and not too many people get that. He still has that little twinkle in his eye. He was always a great kisser, he still is. If you look at his condition before the implant, it goes from a medical condition to a life. We take eating breakfast, hugging the kids, going down to the grocery store for granted. These patients enjoy every day the rest of their life. It's not exactly the honeymoon, but it's pretty close to it. <laughs> Wasn't his time to say goodbye. We want to make this the best place to work, the best place to practice medicine, and the best place to receive care. We want to make everything better. And I know it sounds ridiculous and heady, you know, and people say, how do you do that? But we want that. The Sharp Experience is a promise. It's a promise we've made to ourselves and to our patients to make health care better. Sharp Healthcare is not for profit, but for people. I think patients want health care. And care means so much more than sewing up a cut or giving an antibiotic. It's someone who truly cares for their well-being and their outcome. Access begins by choosing a Sharp affiliated physician. Sharp accepts almost all health insurance. For information, talk to a nurse at 1-800-82-SHARP or visit sharp.com. Never forgetting the human side of healthcare is really what it's all about.